Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. Before I read this passage, we already know that what the Bible is talking about over here. It is talking about a huge beast, and the person who rides on the beast is a woman. And we believe that this woman is referring to Babylon, or a.k.a. it is the Roman Catholic Church. Now, you might say, why is it that this woman is referring to the Roman Catholic Church? We're going to look at the scriptures that prove this, actually. Now, you might say, why is a church like that considered to be the whore of Revelation 17? Because that's pretty strong words when you look at that. Why would the Lord call it that way? Because if you look at history, it's very understandable. The Roman Catholic Church system is a continuation of what God's looking at with pagan Rome. Now, pagan Rome was filled with idolatry and they persecuted Christians, correct? But secular Rome, and the only way you're going to notice this is that if you study history. So that's why it is very important that you study history. Otherwise, you're going to misunderstand or get easily offended. So when you study history, you're going to find out that the, Ro that the Roman system transitioned from a secular power to a religious power, actually. So some of you didn't know that. The secular leaders of Rome, they donned religion, they put on religious costumes, and that's where priests, bishops, and eventually popes came to existence. And that is a matter-of-fact history, even in secular schools. Even in secular schools. Uh, if you read like one of their ancient writings, a great example is Beowulf. That's probably a famous one a lot of people know about. But when you read that work and writing, they were, during that time, they thought that the pagan god was the exact same as Jesus, the Christian god. Because during that time, they were mingling so much paganism with Roman Catholicism. And during that morphing of paganism and Roman Catholicism, that's where it became more Roman Catholic-centered. The Catholic Church, it was not even called Catholic that time, you got to understand. During the early first centuries. The system was born, though, that Roman system, and that word came to be later on. The bishop and priest, they didn't get their names... Uh, at the early centuries. They existed, but they didn't get those titles until much later on. So that's one thing that you've got to understand about the Roman Catholic system is that they have a history of paganism as well as persecution. Because didn't Rome persecute the Christians uh, before it became the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, they started the first persecution of Christians recognized in history was actually by the Roman Empire. Now, that's the official persecution. Concerning local persecution, we obviously know it started with Stephen and his own people, the Jews. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, why are you counting here, Pastor? Because I'm going to talk about a seven-headed beast that this woman is riding on. The woman is, again, referring, to, she is called Babylon by God, but she is known as the Roman Catholic Church. Because here are the keys. One is persecution. It's history of persecution. Because religious Rome, the Roman Catholic, has an infamous history of persecution, which is called the Inquisition. During the timeline of the Inquisition, they literally, this is proven, they literally killed the very smallest number are thousands the largest number is actually millions, more than Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. So a lot of the Catholic scholars, uh, they don't like those numbers because it really makes them look bad, right? Makes them look more evil than Hitler. So because of that, they have to try to uh, make excuses that it's not millions, it's thousands. But that doesn't make a difference anyway. But if you look at the millions total, there are works out there. One of the greatest works is if you compare the population statistic. That's the best one. Because if you look at population statistics, they'll record the Black Plague there, which obviously wiped out a huge amount of the world. But you're going to notice something strange where there's still a, a huge drop of numbers and a very small growth. And when you total all of that, it actually totals to millions. 
one of their arguments is you can't, uh, well, in order to do that, they have to burn like hundreds of people at one day or thousands of people at one day. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But they're like, you can't do that with every burning because when you burn a person at the stake, it takes hours. You never heard of mass burnings? Yeah. That's what they were infamous for. They surrounded families, women, children, yeah. children in one bonfire and burned them all up. And that's how you quickly finish the job. The Jesuits were especially infamous, you got to realize. The Jesuits were especially infamous in specializing in torture, in doing conspiracy tactics. A lot of the things that you might hear about conspiracies, you got to realize that the Jesuits were one of the earliest people, if not the earliest ones. They were one of the earliest peoples who specialized in being undercover agents within politics, kings and governments, etc. These guys... These guys are incredibly powerful because you got to look at their small size. Jesuits aren't big. They're a small size. But when you look at history, even current events today, they dominate as scholars in universities. See, these guys are PhD guys. They're scholars. They're brilliant guys. They can speak several languages. I mean, you got the, uh, you got, uh, the Pope who used to be a Jesuit. These guys are brilliant people. Not only that, they survived 200 years. If not 200 years, then approximately 200 years of oppression, you got to understand. Suppression, excuse me. Suppression. So the Vatican actually kicked them out. I don't know if you knew that. Even So there were Protestant nations kicking out the Jesuits, and then it came down to Catholic nations. Spain, Portugal, etc. Even those guys who had a high value of Jesuits, they even kicked uh, out the Jesuits. And it was so bad that even the Pope himself kicked out the Jesuits as well. And you might say, why is that? The reason why is because even the Pope and the Vatican kicked out the Jesuits because that's how brilliant these guys were, that they were doing cup poisonings everywhere and assassination attempts. In fact, the gunpowder plot, where the translation of the King James Bible, Guy Fox and Robert Catesby connected to Jesuits. Their confessors were Jesuits. So you got to realize that the Roman Catholic Church system, if you even look at current events, all you have to do is think about this. Name me a system, name me any system in the entire world today, and even throughout history, that is the best candidate of the best prospect of both religious and secular power. There's only one city that has religious and political power. Only one. That's Vatican. Amen. That's Vatican. Not even Mecca and all the other Muslim nations have those kind of capabilities. Look at all religions around the world. There are Catholics connected to that. Mm -hmm. Catholics connected to Protestant churches. Catholic connected to modern Bible translations. You'll see Masonic lodges and then they go with the Catholic Knights of Malta. They're all over in religions. The Pope is the one who holds the ecumenical meeting, you know all kinds of religious systems around the world and the Pope is the one who meets secular polit politicians and kings of nations see there is no better candidate when you think about persecution history a combination of religious and political power and not only that their system is female what do they call the Roman Catholic Church they call it mother church right they call it mother church who do they uh, do you notice this high exaltation of Mary yeah. In fact, there are even, uh, this is, uh, these aren't even safe Christians. Even common Catholics will even ask, you know, why is it more about Mary than Jesus? There are even some people asking about that. Oh, we don't worship Mary. We just honor her. It's pretty, pretty much, I mean, if, okay, if you want to call that honor where it's more mentioned than Jesus Christ, then I think that's pretty much, I'm not even going for that kind of honor either. <laughs> okay, so... The woman is known as Revelation 17, Babylon. So let's look at verse 3 over here concerning about the whore of Revelation 17. She is known as Babylon, and she is known to have a cup in her hand. What religion believes in having a cup, right? For worship service. And not only that, she is known for the blood of martyrs throughout history. See, this is all screaming over here that it's plain as day, it's the Roman Catholic Church system. It's Roman system. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. 
So notice it's a scarlet-covered beast that she's sitting on, red-colored. Uh, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So this beast is red-colored. He has seven heads, and he'll have ten horns as well. Let's keep reading verse 4. And the woman was arrayed, look at this, in purple and scarlet colored. She is dressed in purple and red. What religious system has purple and red? Not only that, they would wear those colors while holding a cup. Isn't that kind of even more plain there? Let's keep reading. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a what? Golden cup in her hand. I mean, what religious system fits that bill? Another thing is she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, right? What religious system decks themselves with that? Another thing is that when we look at this woman, she is not only dressed up in red, but this beast is dressed up in red. No, wait a minute. What uh, demonic figure is a red-colored... Uh, Figure having seven heads and ten horns. Did you remember? Go back to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. This is the particular beast that she's riding on, and that's Satan. Now, you know how strong that is? So basically, uh, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but this is going to be true, is that then the Roman Catholic Church, its foundation that it's sitting on is Satan. Amen. That's how the Lord sees it as. A lot of people don't like to acknowledge that or don't want to recognize that. But that you can't deny Scripture, right? Look at Revelation chapter 12, and then we'll read verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red what? Dragon. Dragon that's Satan. Having seven heads and what? Ten horns, seven heads and ten horns. So see, the Roman Catholic Church is sitting. Its seat is Satan itself. Wait a minute. Her seat is Satan. Where is Satan's seat? Remember that term? Yeah. Satan's seat is Revelation 2. Mm -hmm. That was Rome. So see, that's why we know Satan's seat has to be Rome, Revelation 2. That's why we can see Revelation 17, that this is Rome, because everything adds up with the verses when you look at the best prospects in today's timeline. Revelation is dealing with what? Today's future timeline. So you got to look at today's current events in the past and uh, sci even scientifically predict in the future what their actions are going to be. And you can all see it's tied to Roman Catholic Church. Current event, historically, scripturally, logically speaking, and even scientifically speaking when you're predicting things. Okay, so let's return to our main text over here. Now, remember, this is literally word-for-word -word explanation for every verse, right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to pay attention to that. That way you can understand the verses that you're reading. That's the goal of verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, okay? Amen. Okay, so three and four, you notice I didn't explain every single word. I only did certain words, right? Because there's so much stuff here, so I got to knock them off one by one. The next part is I want to cover the first part of verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. So notice God carries John spiritually. So he's at a spiritual plane, right? So God in this spiritual power takes John away into the wilderness. Now, this is something that you want to know, okay? This is very powerful concerning about revelation that it is not a sequential timeline. Okay, so this is something that you want to know. What you desperately want to know concerning about Revelation not being a significant, uh, a sequential, excuse me, sequential timeline is because notice that word. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now, what did I argue before? I argued before when you divide Revelation by chapters, it's not in chronological time events. You can't divide it that way. You have to divide it literally as the book is titled. What? Revelation. See, what is that? That means a spiritual vision or transaction. 
When God gives a spiritual revelation, he can carry you from one domain to a different domain, jump you to a different timeline, to a different person, to a different symbolism, to a literal area. You notice that, right? That's why it's literally called revelation. And this is evidence that this is not time sequence, but more of a spiritual visual moving. That's the sequential order is how he's moving in revelation, in vision. You know, even uh, satanic people, you notice that too, right? Sometimes when they do that, uh, uh, that spiritual plane, they claim they have a revelation or a vision. It's all muddled up, right? It's all muddled up. That's what you got to realize. That's what prophecy and vision and revelation and the Bible is. Is that when God speaks, he's speaking in a spiritual plane. Spiritual plane is not bound by time, matter, space. It's all everywhere. That's why the Holy Spirit can be everywhere. Why? He's not bound by the laws of science. That's why atheists and scientists don't understand a lot of spiritual things in the Bible. Because they're only looking at a physical plane. They're not looking at a spiritual plane, which is a different dimension, so to speak. See? So verse 3 is proof of that. Now, here's bigger proof, okay? If you don't believe it, then look at chapter 16, verse 19. What happened to Babylon here? Chapter 16, verse 19. It's gone. It's gone, and then all of a sudden at chapter 17, it starts? No, the easy answer is this. Verse 19, John is at this spiritual plane, Revelation, and then at verse 3, see, God is taking him from a different spiritual plane now. You notice that? So God is taking him into a different spiritual plane. Here he is in Revelation 16, Babylon falls. And as Babylon falls to the ground, and that is, we know, considered to be the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church system itself, as Vatican burns and falls to the ground, all of a sudden it starts to come out again at Revelation 17. That don't make any sense. That don't make any sense at all. Unless... If you look at verse 3 carefully, it says, he care so he's here spiritually. God carried me away in the spirit into here at the wilderness. See that? He's at a different spiritual world. That's what's going on. So this is not a sequential format. It's different visions revelations, God's moving him toward. Okay, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. This is all coming at once, see that? It's all coming out like that. That's good. So it's all carried away in the spirit, all right? Don't bound the book, don't bind the book of Revelation in physical terms, physical clock sequence, physical time sequence. You gotta go spiritual plane. You notice when God does spiritual calculation in the Bible, a lot of times, like Daniel's uh, 70th week prophecy, when he does a spiritual clock, he doesn't mean that it's gonna be literally 70 weeks long. He interprets it differently by year and day, spiritually. Okay, let's return to our text over here. So I explained the first part of verse three. I explained the middle part of verse 3 at the beginning, but I didn't really explain the last part of verse 3. The last part of verse 3, the scarlet colored beast she's writing on has what? Full of names of blasphemy. Ah, okay, so then this being over here has a lot of names of blasphemy that you want to know about. Why is that very telling? You know why that's very telling? Because the Antichrist, he wants to put... His name in your where? Forehead. Forehead. Remember the Antichrist beast? Not the Satan beast. The Antichrist beast, Revelation 13, he has the name of what? Blasphemy on his forehead. Remember God's 144,000? They have the Father's name on their forehead. That's a big deal. That's a big deal to people. So Satan, he's got names of blasphemy as well. What are those names of blasphemy? Well, for Satan, it's not really known. The Antichrist, we can guess over there, is Vicarious Philly Day. We're at 666. 
we could probably suppose that following that, uh, the, when you look scripture with scripture, names of blasphemy, names of blasphemy, and the only clue you can find is that Vicarious Philly Day 666. And not only that, Revelation 13 says, the mark of the beast name and number, and it is 666, perhaps this thing could also be 666 as well then. But I'm going to put that as a question mark. So it's not really known. But I'll tell you what, is that every verse that you find for names of blasphemy in Revelation, the only clue that it would allow is that one. Let's return over here at verse 4. So verse 4, I explained everything over there. That's the description of the woman, right? But now we're going to come down to the last part, which I didn't really explain at verse 4. Having a golden cup in her hand, full, there it is, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Okay, in this cup, it's supposed to contain the liquid of what? Her abomination and filthiness. So all the wicked things she did. Of her what? Fornication. All, notice God uh, spiritually, this is spiritually, see? Spiritually refers this in a sexual, perverted, uh, luscious, wicked sense. Why? Because I already explained to you at verse 2, right? So I'm not going to explain it again. But at verse 2, I already explained to you that this is referring to spiritual fornication. Because remember, the point of fornication is a mingling, right? Right? of one body to another. That's the idea, right? It's a mingling of one body to another. That's what fornication is. Well, that's what God is condemning at Ezekiel, I showed you before, where Israel was joining her body of a nation with other nations round about her. What? Making compromising, being ecumenical, making dealings, you know, religiously and even politically at Ezekiel. Wait, 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 wait. Ding, light bulb went out. Don't, doesn't the Vatican do this too? See, so this is all screaming out. You notice over here that this is the Roman Catholic Church over here. So this is no doubt referring to Babylon. This is no doubt referring to Babylon over here. Okay, let's continue on. Revelation chapter 17. So this is the filth of her fornication with what? All sorts of nations round about her. So this means that this system is going to be very powerful. The most powerful system it's going to be in the world by the time of the Antichrist. Right now, it may not seem that way where the Vatican is the most powerful system in the world, but you notice that it is building up. And in Revelation, when the Antichrist comes, he will make it full-fledged. He will make it full-fledged.